So I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the 2021 Cal RBS Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Rob Montoya. I am uh, the director of California Rare Book School. Um, this is my first year um, as director, so um, it's a really special uh, summer for me. Um, and uh, I'd like to also introduce Sam Friegel. Many of you uh, have worked a lot with Sam here, um, and Sam is the project manager. And really, it's because of Sam's hard work that um, everything uh, has been going so wonderfully smooth um, this, past, this past week. Um, and uh, just keep in mind that we have uh, another talk next week, as well as a third week, um, and uh, we can distribute uh, information about that through our various social media and information channels. Um, so first, I just want to uh, thank uh, the Information Studies Department. I want to thank the School of Education and Information Studies for being so supportive. Um, and I want to also uh, mention in how much uh, CalRBS values the partnership with the library. Our speaker, Devin Fitzgerald, of course, um, based at the UCLA um, Library, um, as well as our speaker for the third week of California Rare Book School. Um, uh, so that, that is really important. Um, the event is planned to go on for one hour. Um, and we'll try to keep it pretty tight because everybody, I think, is a little bit tired of being on Zoom. Um, and so Devin will um, give his talk. And uh, then we will have a period of questions. Please uh, put your questions in the chat box and Sam, after the talk, will moderate that, um, that discussion. So with that, I'd like to introduce Devin Fitzgerald. Um, Devin is the curator of rare books and the history of printing at UCLA Library Special Collections. Uh, he received his PhD in history and East Asian languages from Harvard University in 2020 um, with a dissertation on the global circulation of Chinese books in the 17th century. Uh, his most recent article, Manchu Language, Pedagogical Practices, the Connections Between Manuscript and Printed Books, explored the history of the Manchu language, uh, Manchu language education during the Qing Dynasty. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Devin. Um, in order to reconstruct the relationships between printed pedagogical genres and their manuscript counterparts. His current book project is a study of comparative Chinese and Anglo-American bibliography. Um, all fit squarely within uh, the uh, interests of our audience here. Um, and the title of his talk is Global Book History and the Library. And so with that, Devin, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for being here. Uh, so much, Rob, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone for making the time to come out today. Um, now, the first thing I'd just like to do is a brief land acknowledgement. Um, as a land-grant institution, the special, collect, uh, special Collections at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of to uh, Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and so uh, South Channel Islands. Um, so based on what Rob just described of my intellectual profile, uh, this, this talk is marks sort of a departure. Um, and the reason for that departure is that because when I was hired at UCLA Libra Library Special Collections, uh, I really began struggling with what it means to be embedded in a research library special collections that attempts to encompass all, basically all global cultures. What are these books in this place doing? Why do we have them? Um, and this talk is in some sense, the result of a protracted uh, struggle session over these very issues. So in late 2019, I began looking closely at some of the undescribed and undercatalogued Asian materials in UCLA Library Special Collections. There were books that made me feel capable. The Manchu, Tibetan, and Thai materials posed little problems, both because of my own training and because UCLA faculty and graduate, student, uh, graduate students helped me. Riding high, I paged a box of six, uh, 16 boxes of brittle palm leaf manuscripts labeled collection of manuscript materials in Tamil, Sanskrit, and Malayan, uh, which arrived in the collection sometime in 1960. Here I am opening the box for the first time. I contacted specialists and shared pictures all to no avail. Almost a year later, these manuscripts are still, were still sitting in the shelves in the secure hall leading to my office, a testament to generations of institutional and curatorial neglect. Now, the story of these palm leaf manuscripts is part of a broader history of the connections 
uh, that I've come to see between racial capitalism and Euro-American institutional rare book collections. One which often elides the fact that bibliographic holdings of many special collections are linked to a global book history that's indebted to Euro-American imperial expansion and settler colonialism. A consideration of library histories in conversation with global book history moves us beyond neutralized stories of individual objects such as these palm leaf manuscripts circulating and allows us to more clearly identify the structural conditions that led to the growth and prestige of the institutions that store these materials. Now, today I'll discuss research library collections as they evolve from the early modern period, that's my real area of specialization, to the modern period, beginning in the 16th century and ending in the early 20th centuries. And we'll focus on Chinese books in the Bodleian Library uh, at Oxford, English looting of Ethiopic manuscripts, and the collecting activities of the Hunting Li Huntington Library. I'll investigate the global roots of book collections by exploring three values shared by most research libraries and the objects they treasure. The curiosity of these objects, an interaction with colonialism, and their role in creating different forms of canon. Now, the creation of these values, why we value these things, is not neutral. Rather, it needs to be considered as part of the process which transformed the value of books as commodities or sacral objects into books as artifacts housed in Western institutions. Uh, now, the values explored in these cases will allow us to consider how racial capitalism informed the valuation of texts and the creation of rare book collections. Now, I know you're all wondering, what is racial capitalism? So we're going to begin this talk with just two, two terms. These are my working definitions uh, and not particularly rigorous. Uh, racial capitalism, capitalism, as defined by Nancy Leon, is the process of deriving social or economic value from the racial identity of another person. In my case, and following Jesse Erickson's notion of ethnobibliography, this is the process of valuing books in terms connected to their stated and unstated racialized features. Capaciously conceived, racial capitalism informed how early collectors and contemporary collectors uh, determined which books were valuable, valuable enough to be special and or rare. Now, as deployed in this talk, white supremacy is understood as the superstructural hegemony that emerged in the West from settler colonialism. It is rooted in early modern and contemporary negation of black lives. The growth of white supremacy, which truly began in the early modern period, provided justification for the growth of cultural, institutional, and political structures, which treated Anglo-European culture as normative and defined in contrast to values from outside this imagined tradition. White supremacy provided the institutional norms and ideologies that contributed to global empire building. So white supremacy and racial capitalism, i.e. the ideology behind these structures, and then the reason we value things are overlapping and intertwining. And I believe that by historicizing examples around the creation of value in different contexts, we can begin to see how they inform the growth of rare book collections. Now, we'll begin in the early modern period. So most studies about global books focus on the circulation of single objects or juxtaposed book cultures or explore the contents of a single work in divergent contexts. These studies show how the show the global book as something that led to, and I quote, the conditions for global imagination and cosmopolitan community by creating points of intercultural contact. While these approaches are essential for reconstructing processes of cultural globalization, they also raise questions about histories of collecting. If we step back from exam specific examples of circulation and consider books in their institutional context, a picture of global book history rooted in collections of texts allows us to consider how objects institutions and these uh, superstructures intertwined to create the context for a, the emergence of a global book history. Now, for the year 1700, Chinese books arrived in Europe in a gradual trickle. Early accounts of Chinese books indicate that they first arrived via the Iberian Peninsula owing to early Portuguese and Spanish exploration of East Asia. Catherine of Austria, Queen Regent of Portugal, owned two Chinese books, which she displayed to visitors. 
Um, these works left a deep impression on the scholar Bernardino de Escalante, who noted that the Chinese had been printing for many years before Europeans. From Iberia, Chinese materials made their way to other parts of Europe. Uh, as noted in the four, uh, 1545 History of the World, uh, Paolo Giovio, there are at Canton printers who print according to their own method uh, books containing histories and rites. Pope Leo has graciously shown, uh, shown me a volume of this sort given as a present with an elephant by the King of Portugal. Here is uh, an image of that elephant from his epitaph, Hanno the Elephant, very famous in Rome. He, he was something of a, a celebrity, celebrity, very much eclipsing the Chinese books. But the book described by Giovio was presented alongside this elephant as an example of an exotic gift. Giovio, Giovio's account, which is widely regarded as the first Western account to hypothesize about the Chinese origins of European printing shows how Chinese books existed as diplomatic gifts, as curiosities. Now paired with Hanno, the Pope also displayed his new book to many of his, new, uh, of his friends. And what they saw was a book as this inscription in Dutch from 1604 notes, with narrow and long leaves of thin and smooth paper upon which they write, not from left hand to right, nor like the Hebrews from right to left, but from bottom to top. Uh, now, the book that arrived in Rome or books like it were seen by laser, later vi visitors, uh, such as uh, Montaigne, who noted in his travel journal to Italy that he saw these books in the Vatican Library. And he described it as a book of landish characters, the leaves of some material much softer and more uh, 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 pelucid than our paper, it's, uh, flexible. Now, these descriptions show that when they arrived in 16th century Europe, Chinese books were some of the many objects that contributed in some ways to the relativization of European experience. The books, like many curiosities, were fondled by visitors. Possession of these books did as Dastin and Park have noted of other collections of wonder. They represented, and I quote, they represented and in part constituted the wealth and power of those who owned them. On a more abstract level, a rarity or uniqueness reflected the rarity and uniqueness of their proprietors, conceived in terms of nobility and cultivation. So it's no wonder that we find Chinese books in places like the El Escorial Library established by Philip II, the Vatican Library, or the Herzog August Bibliothek. Uh, these texts were part of a European economy of curiosity. Now, Chinese books were also, of course, collected in institutions, uh, such as at Oxford. Uh, most of the books in the uh, Bodleian, Lib Bodleian Library were donated to the collection by English savants. The earliest books, one of which was given to the library by Thomas Bodley himself, uh, likely traveled to Europe on Dutch East India Company ships. An interest in these books was substantial enough that there was even an auction of Chinese books in 1605 in Holland. Since most Chinese books are composed of multiple volumes, uh, the auction appears to have broken multi-volume works for resale as individual units. As these two cases, one book from, uh, or as these two cases, one book from the collection of Robert Doyle given to the Bodleian, and one from the collection of Archbishop William Loud given to the Bodleian. So you can see these were part of real elite networks of sociability and presentation. Now, after entering the library, the Chinese books were gradually rebound in limp vellum, rather than in the Chinese method of thread binding, which was much more flexible. Uh, and they, this was done so that they could stand in archive cabinet A in the library itself in European style. Chinese, and these Chinese books at Oxford were just used as curiosities. They were little known until the summer of 1687 when they then became some of the first books to be accurately described. Michael Shun Fuzon, a Chinese Jesuit, traveled to Oxford at the request of Thomas Hyde to describe the collection, thus producing the first catalog of Chinese books at Oxford. For a brief moment, as William Poole has shown, intellectuals in England turned to Shun, whom Hyde called by Chinese, for information about China. After Shun left, the books returned to archive cabinet A, and you, he was paid, you can see this entry over here in, in the library accounts, 
uh, and they mostly sat unused in the cabinet until the 19th century when Sinology restarted in England. Now, the case of Chinese books at Oxford provides insight into this early period of the development of a research library, which we might call the pre-European hegemonic period, uh, or the pre-hegemonic European period that saw the development of oriental studies as a diffuse activity among scholars of different sorts, reliant on lavishly sponsored collections or fortu uh, fortuitously procured texts. Chinese books were curios, uh, but this curiosity frequently served European intellectual ends. Uh, while curious objects could change European assumptions about the world, more often than not, their mystique was stripped away and they contributed a sense of Western superiority uh, as Europeans use them to confirm their own biases. Despite Europeans' long-standing interest in collecting quote-unquote oriental books, the early modern period also saw the intentional erasure of some textual cultures at the hands of European empire builders. The fires of New Spain, for instance, burned uncounted Latin Amer un uncountable Latin American codices. These fires then out augured Enlightenment chauvinism, which saw the maturation of European views of other cultures as not only alien, but also inferior. Such nascent notions of Western superiority combined with the very real need to deal with colonial governance in languages like Persian, Malay, uh, as well as you know, Hindi. Um, so libraries transformed into more than just symbolic centers. They became repositories for materials which could provide a foundation for exerting rule over conquered sub subject populations. During the 19th century, a global plundering of libraries transferred the textual wealth uh, of the world to a number of European and American libraries and museums. As John Hodgson has noted, institutional collections at the heart of empire continually re reaffirmed, indeed reenacted British conquests, military, political, and cultural. Manuscripts thus functioned as instruments of colonial intelligence gathering and control. While it's certainly true that libraries around the world and through most periods of time have always been targets for theft and destruction, what occurred during the 19th century far surpassed previous levels. One looting that captured the attention of English reading publics, as well as American reading publics, occurred in Ethiopia with the capture of manuscripts from the fortress of Magdala. The man manuscripts in Magdala were collected from across Ethiopia to support the self-legitimating agenda of Emperor Tewodros II. Manuscripts for the library were connected, collected from Gondar, which foreign observers claims, claimed Tewodros plundered for prayer books there and their other old documents before setting churches on fire. Now, the British invaded Ethiopia because Emperor uh, Tewodros imprisoned several missionaries in frustration after years of seeking British support to quell rebellions. The English expedition saw the captives released without harm, but resulted in Tewodros committing suicide so as to avoid capture. When Makdala was taken by the English in April 1868, the English found the plunder collected by the king, including tons of Gez and Amharic manuscripts in the treasury. These materials were gathered by prize officers for auctions, and when they were put up for auction, Richard Rivington Holmes, uh, who was the official archaeologist appointed by the British Museum, did aggressively to secure as many manuscripts as possible. Now, one interesting aspect about Holmes and the prize auction of the manuscripts is that they represented something rather new. They were they're the result of an intentional policy of systemic, uh, systematic manuscript collection. Even before the campaign was launched, officials had determined that Ethiopic manuscripts were of interest to the empire. In 1867, John Winter Jones, the principal librarian of the British Museum, uh, and also the first president of the, the British uh, Library Council, I believe, um, wrote to the Secretary of State of India, who was in charge of the operation, noting the importance of Ethiopic sources to various branches of learning. He wrote, Abyssinia, moreover, possesses one of the oldest Christian churches in the East, and it may be reasonably anticipated that numerous ancient manuscripts must have been preserved there. 
the trustees are desirous to recommend to Her Majesty's government that a competent archaeologist accompany the forest to collect inscriptions, coins, gems, manuscripts, ethnographical, and other objects, and as occasion might offer, transport them to England for the trustees of the British Museum. While the campaign into Ethiopia was considered excessively expensive by most people, uh, especially given that it was over a matter of honor, for Jones and the trustees, it was an opportunity for new bibliographical acquisitions. When Holmes returned to England with the nearly 300 manuscripts, uh, they were turned over to the British Museum for processing by the Orientalist William Wright, who became professor of Cam of Arabic at Cambridge in 1870. Wright's career illustrates how, whether they liked it or not, even armchair Orientalists were beneficiaries of empire. Born in India, the Scotsman's first position was as professor of Arabic at the University College London, where part of his duties included training future colonial officers in Persian, an important language used for governing India. From 1861 to 1869, he worked for the British Museum in the manuscript section. Um, and his letters are pretty funny about this uh, because he actually worked in the Western manuscript section. And so they're full of him complaining about only working with old English materials like the Beowulf manuscript. He just was not interested uh, in, in European materials per se. Now, when the Makdala manuscripts arrived at the British Museum, and you can see here are a couple of their, I mean, they're gloriously illustrated. Here you can see the stamp that says, presented by the Secretary of, in, uh, of State uh, for India, August 1868. Um, and these are very well-known collection. There's been a lot of work in the British uh, Library about them and raising awareness of them being looted. So this is not uh, necessarily news. But I, Right is kind of underappreciated. Now, so when these Makdala manuscripts arrived at the British Museum, there was initially excitement that they might contain texts lost in other Christian traditions. Uh, the importance of the Makdala manuscripts in England had nothing to do with an attempt to better understand Ethiopia or its important place in history. Instead, they became part of a grand Protestant tradition of seeking to excavate a truer version of Christianity from allegedly ancient documents. Wright actually vied for the privilege of cataloging the manuscripts, but he soon discovered that the looted manuscripts were not sufficiently ancient to be of substantial scholarly interest beyond the field of Semitics, as, as he noted in his preface to the catalog. Indeed, in correspondence, he described the project as wearisome, laborious and thankless work uh, for which even those who profit by it never seem thankful. So next time you see a bibliographer, everyone, please thank them. Uh, this I think is a universal, a universal sent sentiment. It is wearisome work. Now, while Wright's letters and his scholarship are generally devoid of much political content, I think that part of the reason for his ultimate lack for, of enthusiasm for the collection was because they played to, failed to play into his fantasies of an ancient and unchanging Ethiopic church. Like many of his generations, generation, we could generously call right paternalistic in his views of non-white peoples. And when contemporary realities intruded on his love of antiquity, he was generally displeased, as when he called the Shah, Shah of Qajar Iran a dirty mushroom, and then reflected on the great misfortune of the sudden emancipation of enslaved Black Americans, noting that this race is not prepared for unrestrained freedom. So for Wright, Blackness and antiquity was perhaps not a problem. Um, and it probably wasn't even a problem for the British Museum manuscript collections. Contemporary Blackness left much to be desired. Now, the looting of libraries for political prestige was, of course, not a new phenomenon in world history. Yet, the global imperial context of the 19th century made this looting qualitatively different. While earlier looters built libraries of books that they did not see as having been produced by inferior others, uh, they were part of traditions they looted in, con uh, in conquest, such as Yoshimune uh, taking books from Korea. In Europe, materials were put, put into libraries as monuments to European superiority. In the display of loot in sponsored catalogs and as gifts to the queen, 20 of the Mock Dollar manuscripts were given to Queen Victoria, played a symbolic function. European 
empires engage in what Kerry has dis described as intellectual Greek capitalism in its purest form, purest form, invaluable for subsequent Western scholars, deeply impoverishing for those non-European societies who fell victim to its depredations. And as Yerga Galau uh, Wodeis has noted of the Matbala manuscripts, it's imperial looting divorced texts from their uh, communities by often quite literally burying them in Western institutions like saints' bodies. So in the United States, the relationship between settler colonialism, white supremacy, and research libraries is intertwined with, a pat with patently American institutions, such as land-grant universities and privately established research libraries. Anglo-Americans, who for a long time imagined themselves on the frontiers of Western civilization, did not engage in the sy a systematic collection of materials from other cultures until the 20th century when many began arriving at new nations of the role of the United States in the world. Area studies libraries and non-Western rare book collections were generally only a consideration after securing strong collections that exemplified the values of Anglo-American whiteness. One of several North American research libraries explicitly designed to celebrate Western civilization was the Huntington Library, which was built from the private collection of Henry E. Hunting. In Huntington and open to the public in 1925. Through the late 19th century, Henry Huntington amassed his wealth in railroads and eventually property development. His wealth was built on the American conquest and colonization of the, Amer of the West, which enabled the Huntington family to amass wealth in the railroad industry, light rail, and property development. Now, as Huntington's riches grew, his passion for books grew into an obsession. Huntington himself collected modestly up until about 1900. After 1900, he began collecting in earnest, spending an estimated $61,181, or over $2 million today, on books between 1901 and 1905. After 1905, he began spending even more on books, and his purchasing habits also included buying complete libraries. One of the crowning acquisitions of Huntington's collection was the purchase of the Bridgewater Library in 1917. Founded by Thomas Edgerton, who died in 1617, the library grew to over 8,000 printed books and over 13,000 manuscripts. And its acquisition was lauded as one of the literary treasures of America, and it transferred a small piece of England to California. The Bridgewater Library was, in many respects, a perfect acquisition to celebrate the canon of English language and literature. Uh, Edgerton and his heirs were deeply embedded in uh, social spheres of their time and rubbed elbows with some of the most important playwrights and authors of the 17th century. Uh, the library had its own first folio, quartos printed from when Shakespeare was still alive, probably that Edgerton bought when uh, Shakespeare was still alive an important Caxton, as well as a wide variety of manuscripts. One of the most important acquisitions in the library was undoubtedly the Ellesmere Chaucer, which sits on permanent display in the Huntington's Library, Huntington's, uh, library Exhibition Hall, feet away from a Gutenberg Bible and another few feet away from the necessary ode to Shakespeare. Its symbolic placement in the Exhibition Hall leaves little doubt about the importance of Anglo-American literature to the library's mission. Now, the Huntington Library that opened in 1925 was part of something much bigger. Um, and this, I think, is where people will think I'm getting a little controversial. Um, it was an institution, I would argue, that grew with explicit ties to white supremacy in the contested spaces of early California. Its first board consisted of friends of Henry Huntington, including the famed George, uh, George E. Halley, as well as George S. Patton, father to the general uh, of the same name. Patton was a close friend of Huntington and frequent partner in his business dealings in Southern California. As a member of the Southern gentry who emigrated to California after the Civil War, he was also committed uh, to making California, I quote, a vanguard of Aryan civilization. The library was part of this vision. He noted in a letter to George Halley in 1925 that the intellectual development of the race 
was furthered by the establishment in California of research institutions like the Huntington Library. The library and its English books were imagined as part, a cultural fortress that would defend Anglo-European culture on the Western frontier. This vision was also articulated by one of the library's other early trustees, Robert Andrews Milliken, a towering figure in Southern California history, who was appointed to the Huntington Library Board of Trustees in 1925. Milliken's responsibilities on the board were manifold. As a prominent humanist scientist, he won a Nobel Prize in physics, uh, for example, but was one of, one of the most important people at Caltech. He was committed to a teleological vision of history which placed white Western civilization at the pinnacle of development. As we see in this quote here, uh, in 1924, in his book, Science and Life, Millikan noted, and if you wish to see the practical results of the change of this changing of the way men think, Look at the difference between our civilization and the static civilizations of Asia. In certain sections of the world, primarily those inhabited by the Nordic race, a certain set of ideas have got a start in men's minds, the ideas of progress and of responsibility. An examination of Millikan's papers from his time out on the board at the Huntington illustrates that he was not alone in his enthusiasm for promoting the unique achievements of the Nordic race. Uh, instead, he the executive board and librarians um, all worked together to make the library, which was the furthest outpost of Aryan Nordic civilization, as Millikan called Los Angeles, a center to celebrate the white race. In a 1927 framing document produced by the first director of the library, Max Ferrand, he described the importance of the Huntington in similar terms. Fran congratulated the board and Huntington for creating a library dedicated to, I quote, the development of Anglo-American civilization. You can see it here, uh, uh, which he then noted uh, that this was greater than the mandate which controls the Library of Congress or even the British Museum. Similar sent sentiments were echoed by Lewis B. Wright in 1932, when he noted the centrality of studying the English Renaissance for understanding modern American society. Voiced by several members of Huntington board, Huntington board, Huntington's board, such statements demonstrate the symbolic importance of the library in broader white agendas. The library's white supremacy sometimes crept into public view too. Milliken, along with other members of the Huntington Board of Trustees, joined a campaign to keep San Marino white. In February 1942, when race restrictions on property ownership were set to expire, the San Marino Civic Betterment Association wrote to Milliken and other Huntington trustees to ensure their support for the restrictions. Since the Huntington Library could never be sold, Milliken and the board saw no need to sign the race covenant. However, the financial arm of the, of the Huntington estate the Huntington Land and Improvement Co. was advised by Milliken that it was in a different situation. And here you can see some of these, these figures, William Bennett Monroe, uh, who was a prominent eugenicist. Here's Milliken at the end. Um, we've got Hoover and uh, Hubble. Now, the case of the Huntington Library may not seem to be in the same genealogy as imperial looting or curio collecting. But if we consider uh, that the funding for libraries like the Huntington, we can see how powerful forces combined financial and sy symbolic commitment to make libraries which would reflect an idealized America. The American industrials would build libraries because of profits from American imperial violence. Much like the collection in the British Museum, the wealth generated by American settler colonialism and chattel slavery eventually supported library building. And this is very direct, of course, in many East Coast institutions, such as the University of Virginia or Brown University. The values of settler colonialism, including white supremacy, inspired American elites and library boards to build collections of rare books that rep represented themselves. Rather than acquiring curiosities through or through conquest, Huntington and the board attempted to create and fortify identities valued at primarily in terms of their proximity to whiteness. Even with well-intentioned curators, white supremacist legacies still define many collections. As Jesse Erickson has noted, 
its ghosts are frequently haunting the gentleman's studies design of many reading rooms. While varied in their specifics, the cases outlined in this essay are all framed by the context of Euro-American global hegemony as it developed from the early modern period into modernity. Each of these values, curiosity, colonialism, and canon building, are indelibly linked to intellectual values generated by white supremacy as they have manifested in special collections libraries in the West. Um, now, using these terms as they intertwine with the concept of racial capitalism, we can see how identities associated with the producers of books shaped their value for collecting repositories. In the case of Chinese books, simple commercial imprints became ciphers for Europeans to ponder, and their material features made them curiosities to be marveled at. The Makdala manuscripts tapped into European beliefs that a somehow more primitive Africa uh, had preserved lost texts. Once this proved untrue, their value diminished in the eyes of both their cataloger and the British Museum. Finally, the Huntington Library was built to ex explicitly to celebrate white Western achievements. Even as the institution has changed, the permanent exhibition hall still tells this story by and large. Uh, but it is changing, and the Huntington is, of course, like all institutions in the West, grappling with these legacies. So this is not a hit piece. Uh, this is more a piece that puts this story into a new, deeper historical context. Now, I think it should be clear, that to some extent, all rare book collections are products of ideology, uh, one that is often solidified in collection development policies. The fantasy of a collecting institution where learning is free from political entanglement needs to be abandoned. The decision to collect any rare book, any book at all, within an institutional framework has always been both a financial and symbolic decision. It costs money, time, and effort to acquire, catalog, and preserve books. And it's critical to remember that collecting priorities are intellectual, and political priorities that derive many of their ideas of value from racial capitalism that has defined the global system. The fact that UCLA's collection of palm leaf manuscripts remains uncatalogued and neglected uh, is a legacy of an acquisition that didn't quite fit. And it speaks to the tensions of racial capitalism as it contributed to developing global book histories. We'll take it, we say, while we never really imagine what to do with these objects. The curio is something made possible now by a hegemonic uh, colonial world, and it got shunted into the storage rooms. While global book history shows us how individual objects were part of global histories and how more broadly defined book cultures are inter interdependent, these histories have yet to reckon with how institutional trends in collecting reveal systemic changes that reflect white supremacy and racial capitalism and how they have come to shape our globe. Um, and as just the final addenda, while writing the original version of this paper many months ago, um, I discovered something quite interesting, which is that in UCLA Library Special Collections, we also have a manuscript from the Makdala Libraries, which was acquired in auction uh, in 1960 by one of our famous and prominent Ethiopian uh, uh, semeticist, Wolf Leslau, who is a very interesting and great figure. Um, and so with that final bit to chew on, I think that brings me to my time. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Devin. That was a truly fascinating talk. Um, I'm sure we all have much to think about. Um, so we're now going to move into our Q&A portion. And as we said at the start, um, we're going to ask you to please submit your questions in the chat, uh, which I'll be monitoring, and I will read them to Devin. So take a moment. Think about what you just heard. OK, we have a question from Mindy. Did any of these three aspects of value shape or inform the collecting practices or general orientations of research libraries in non-Western regions in the 20th century? Yeah, um, great question, Mindy. And this is really part two of this paper that I'll maybe write someday. Um, this 
really is a question of global hegemony in, in many ways. And so if you look at places where these sorts of encyclopedic universal collections have existed, um, there are very, very few places outside the West, with one notable exception, of course, being Japan. Um, so Japan in the late 19th, early 20th century uh, began, especially Japanese industrialists, uh, began collecting Western rare books as well as other Eastern rare books. And part of this was, as I know you know, uh, it was part of a broader research agenda, again, preparing for Japanese colonization of Northeast Asia. So a library like the Toyo Bunko, the East Asia Research Library, fantastic library, um, is a collection of Chinese Korean books, as well as many, many Western books that were um, collected by an Australian collector in Beijing. Uh, but in pl a place like China, the collections of Western books have a different genealogy. So when the Jesuits are exiled, uh, expelled from Beijing, their libraries remain in Beijing. The Xu Jiahui Library uh, in Shanghai, for example, uh, this was a Jesuit library associated with a, a mission, uh, not, not Jesuit, I can't remember which fraternity it was. Um, but in the late 19th century, they had a very good library there. And now it's part of the Shanghai library system. So it's a public library. And they have, again, started buying very many Western books just in the last 15 to 20 years, Western rare books uh, on Sino-Western relations. So now that China is wealthy, I think we can anticipate uh, in the next 20 to 30 years, um, attempts to build these sorts of global collections. That said, you know, antiquity export laws now exist that didn't exist, um, you know, really before 1950. And so uh, no place in the world will be able to catch up with the competitive advantage of Western collecting institutions um, because of that, the periodization of these events. Thanks, Devin. We have another uh, question from Chase. I was really fascinated that you used the example of palm leaves. I was curious if you could potentially expand on how the delimiting of what was and was not a book as opposed to a manuscript or another category influenced how Europeans formulated their own cultural supremacy. For example, I thought it was really interesting that even though it appeared that the collectors recognized the Chinese printed texts they collected as objects worthy of collection and display, they still rebound the documents to align with Western binding conventions. Yeah, um, yeah, this is a very um, loaded and, and uh, important question. Um, so I would say, you know, in that 19th century context, um, there was, that was really when we start seeing the development in sophisticated ways of difference between manuscript and print, especially in library cataloging practices, uh, storage. Uh, and that's really when we start seeing Europeans getting interested in something like palm leaf manuscripts. It's because there are so many Europeans uh, in Southeast Asia, Oriental Studies is developing. People are getting very serious about things like Sanskrit, Pali. Um, and so most of those books were taken as they were, um, by which I mean they were understood to be uh, manuscripts representing a textual tradition that was of interest to Orientalists and didn't necessarily need to be rebound or conform to European standards. Um, the Chinese books have a little bit of a different genealogy. Let me just grab one of mine off my shelf right here. So, you know, with a Chinese book, this is this is what you get. This this very light, flexible thing. Uh, and so, it's not that Europeans are, you know, engaging in some sort of colonial activity when they're rebinding this. You can see the thread at the top. It's that this looks like a book that's just been loosely gathered in sheets. It just looks like an un, unfinished product, essentially. Um, and so, you know, for someone at the, the Baldwin Library, they probably just thought they had something that was equivalent to like a pamphlet. Uh, and then they put it in a nicer binding because these were valuable books to them. Uh, of course, they didn't understand that uh, binding Chinese books in that Western style is really bad for the paper. It's not sh as strong as Western paper. So it, these books are all gradually ripping out of, out of the binding. Um, more interestingly then is in the 19th century European Orientalists, um, again, in China start collecting lots of Chinese books. And because they're multifacetal, uh, you know, this, this book here is actually, uh, 
25 volumes this size. So this, this figure, James Legg, whose collection is in the New York Public Library now, he just took all of these individual volumes and stuck them together and made a big fat boy tome, uh, essentially. And now these are, of course, all falling apart because, again, the paper couldn't handle it. But for people just researching, uh, you know, that was just deemed to be a reasonable thing to do. Um, but, you know, there's now in the last, and then I'll end this, this uh, in the last five, 10 years, there's been a lot of research on European Orientalist engagement with uh, Arabic, Turkish, Persian manuscripts in the 17th, 18th century. Uh, and here, you know, that those codec cultures are genealogically um, much, much closer, and they interact uh, in, I'd say, pretty favorable ways uh, with, with um, early is Islamic manuscripts in Europe. They don't necessarily see them as qualitatively different. They just wonder why printing isn't being used. I don't know if I got all of the points, but that's, that's the best I can do right now. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Shirley about the photo embedded in the email announcement. Where in China was that photo taken? Oh, uh, that that is uh, from the Palace Museum, and I was there to look at some wood blocks. And so I was uh, there. Was the tower behind me was actually at the time full of Tibetan and Manchu wood blocks from Palace Imperial Printing. So I was just there uh, working with another librarian to take a look at these. Great. So our next question comes from Nina. Curious if you could expand on your final point about collecting without, quote, knowing what to do with it. I'm thinking of how to describe, promote, and teach with materials collected years ago that librarians may not be able to read or contextually understand, realizing that UCLA and other large universities have lots of experts who may be able to help provide, so not use the um, Thanks, Nina. That's a really great question. Um, and so for these sorts of things, uh, I guess I have you know, a, a rough sort of tripartite approach. Um, so in my own experience, for example, when I found these Thai manuscripts uh, in a box, I couldn't, couldn't identify them. And so I reached out to the art history department and there was a great PhD candidate who's, who's since graduated, uh, Maya Chua, who knew someone in, the, in LACMA who read Thai. And so we identified them like that. Um, so that community is there. In the case of UCLA's Ethiopic manuscripts, uh, most of which arrived uh, 2007 or 2009, uh, that relied heavily on community engagement. So the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox community in Los Angeles helped uh, with some of the early cataloging. Um, and so, you know, there's community, there's scholars, but this is the point I think that most people tend to resist the most on, which is that um, this is also an opportunity for librarians to express our ideological commitments to ignorance as virtue. Uh, and by this, I mean, you can begin a new path of assessing and relating to these materials. And so, you know, as I was saying to Rob and Sam before, the last two and a half months of my life have been incredibly busy because I've been doing intensive classical Ethiopic guz. Um, so that we can work with these materials in a new way in UCLA special collections. And this won't involve me saying, I am a specialist on Ethiopic manuscripts. That'll never, never happen. That's a life of work. But it means I'm now in conversation with people who can appreciate my effort and we can build new networks with me as sort of like a cheerleader to this academic community. And I think this is something librarians need to do more. And more generally, as inheritors of global imperialism, um, we need to stop being... Um, not, uh, we need to cultivate new virtues of multilingualism and multiculturalism uh, in every part of the structure. So we have a question from Megan. How can current curators balance the desire to diversify their collection with the problem of predominantly white institutions gobbling up other people's finite cultural artifacts? Um, that is... Uh, the question of the day, Megan, and a very good question. Uh, and I have a couple of different things. The first is that I believe uh, in new collection development priorities to change, obviously, the shape of your institution. Uh, so if you collected exclusively in one area that represented something like what the Huntington's collection does, I do think you have a moral obligation to buy materials to reframe that. Uh, and so my, one of my answers to that, for example, is collecting European imprints in Near Eastern languages. 
So they're printed in Europe. And that's great because it changes the profile of our European collection, but also gets more attention on our enormous um, and underappreciated Islamic manuscript collection. The other response to this uh, is, I think, to go out to your communities. Um, if you have communities in an area you're looking to serve, uh, you have to figure out what sorts of research materials they're interested in having. And maybe you shouldn't just be collecting you know, Black Americana because lots of people are wanting to fill those gaps right now. Maybe you should be finding out what uh, local African-American communities uh, in your area of value and figuring out how to get those materials into the collection to represent them. Um, you know, and then at the end of the day, for things like 16th, 17th century Chinese books uh, or pre-modern Japanese books, these things have always been commercial products. Um, their meaning changed in a curiosity cabinet, but I think aggressively reasserting in some ways that they are commercial products and meant to be traded and part of the healthy and robust book trade is also an important thing to do. We have to de um, desacralize East Asian books and normalize them as a part of another book culture. So those are kind of the three um, three tacks I would take um, to addressing these sorts of issues. Thank you. So we have time for one or maybe two other questions. If anyone has has anything, you can add it to the chat. Shirley asked which palace about your uh, your photo in in the announcement. Oh, it was the 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 Gugong, just the, the Forbidden City. So it was the north wall of the, the Forbidden City. Right. So Sarah asks, is repatriation ever a question with unique items? Uh, boy, it's is it a question for whom? Uh, yeah, so from my perspective, uh, as a person responsible for books that have perhaps some ethical questions, repatriation is always the preferred method, um, especially if it's linked specifically to these, these famous looting events. Um, that said, the British Library has taken a very different track, which is their argument that we're a cosmopolitan center and these books belong to everyone uh, is, you know, that's also compelling. You know, we do want to live in a cosmopolitan board free of, uh, world free of borders, you know, except then you go to things like Brexit. Uh, and you have Eth the Ethiopian community for years and years and years asking for repatriation. Two years after these uh, manuscripts arrived in London, they, there was a request to repatriate these materials. They're doled out occasionally, all of the Makdala loot, uh, which includes crowns, lots of other objects. They're doled out, uh, historically were, bef before the royal family was deposed, uh, to the royal family on occasions as treats and trinkets to show the great benevolence of the British Empire. Um, and, you know, they've give, they'll give flash drives to people with all their manuscripts and they can go into national reading rooms. But I think at the end of the day, if you've got the digital facsimile, why don't you return the books? Um, there's, it, it seems to me, uh, you know, as we all know, it doesn't matter where your library is located. It will go up in fire someday. This is a historical truth. And the paternalistic assumption that the British library is a more secure structure uh, than other libraries, I think needs to be reassessed more more honestly, um, you know, all it takes is a single pipe burst and your books in a very well-funded library can be destroyed. TK asks, is there a place for digital post-custodial projects in the rare books field, which is typically so fixated on the physical object? Um, there are lots and lots of, um, you know, important, and, you, and you, you know about lots of these TK, things like the Endangered Archives archives program. Um, and so right now we're at the, I'd say we're really at phase one of these major digital projects, which is we're going out and we're photographing and trying to take care of collections that are, that are at risk. And, uh, you know, I think you probably would have a, a better understanding of where we're going in, in the future. Um, sorry, let me go go back to the question so I can make sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, 
unfortunately am inadequately prepared to give you a, a really good answer on this question. So our final question tonight will come from Colleen. I worry a bit about special collections reaching out to language experts to utilize their expertise for free. Do you know of any examples of success in funding this work internally, grants? Yeah, Colleen, that's a really, really good point. Um, and obviously you don't want to take advantage of, of language experts, especially uh, from communities that are not getting a fair shake in the first place in terms of academic positions and promotion. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of grants that would enable this sort of work. And I think this is something we can talk about later. But I think internally, you know, this is something that more special collections libraries can start doing is just setting some money aside to develop good relationships with graduate students in various area studies um, and creating healthy relationships within ecologies that exist already within higher education. Um, so, for example, I uh, was going to go to the Library of Congress to help them catalog their Manchu books before I started at UCLA. Uh, but because it was the Library of Congress, the paperwork came three years late. Um, so, uh, but other than that, you know, these sorts of relationships are great. I would have loved that as a researcher. And knowing that I love it as a researcher means that I'm very excited to create similar opportunities for other researchers, as long as we have the funding to help them be paid for their labor. Thank you so much, Devin. Um, that concludes our Q&A session for today. And I'm gonna pass it back over to CalRBS Director Rob Montoya for a few final words. Thank you, Sam. And, and thank you so much, Devin, um, for that really enlightening talk. I think these are really important uh, conversations for us to be having in the profession and to um, have a talk like this that was, that was so pointed yet balanced, I think is, is really good, um, is a good um, step um, to that end. Um, uh, speaking of this, um, I wanted to uh, mention two uh, talks that will be coming up um, next week um, on Wednesday, same time, 5.30. Um, I'll be speaking um, about California Rare Book School in particular as a continuing education program. Uh, the title of that talk is Global Justice and an Ethical Imperative, CalRBS at a Social Crossroad. And in many ways, I think um, I'll you know, pick up the baton um, in that talk to speak to how continuing, ed continuing education programs and, and, and to what extent um, these programs um, have a responsibility right, to be able to, to, to train our profession, our professionals um, in these very topics right, so that we can confront them um, respectfully within the workplace through various avenues, be it programming, through collection management, um, pedagogy. Um, and so I hope you join us for that. Um, and then Wednesday, um, August 18th, uh, TK Sangwand, uh, another colleague at the library, the UCLA library, uh, librarian for uh, digital collection development, will be speaking um, about uh, a recent program uh, facilitated at the UCLA library by TK um, about radical publishing in Mexico City. And the title of that talk is Prison Libraries, Indigenous Typography and Experimental Publishing. Reflections on Radical Publishing in Mexico City in CDMX. Um, so I just want to express my thanks to Devin once again for your talk. Um, my thanks to everybody for joining us this evening on Zoom, which we are doing, I think, uh, far too much these days. Um, so it is much appreciated. Um, and thank you to the faculty um, of California Rare Book School for doing an awesome job this week. I'm getting a lot of feedback and everybody's really happy. And of course, the participants um, who make this program as amazing as it is. So with that, I wish everybody a good evening or a good morning, depending on where you are in the world. And um, until next week, um, when I hope to see you again. Be well, everybody. <laughs>